Hello, welcome back to McKinley. Today's video is going to be about how big your boosters have to be and also how do you protect your layout from short circuits. I'm standing in the middle of the island on the power wall on the extension of McKinley and in here there are eight panel boxes and seven of the eight have boosters. On each panel wall we're using an, an RR amp meter to measure the current output from each booster. They're not cheap to buy and I don't know easy ones to get hold of but what I do know which could be useful is that they produce a plug and play version of this device which has leads which you could break into your command station supplied to your track and that would show you the voltage levels the DCC voltage levels and the current draw and if you're getting anywhere near the limit of your layout then you could then separate your layout into booster areas. Right now we have not populated Hades which is what most of these boosters will be supplying power to and therefore because this is relatively inaccessible we put permanent RR amp meters in on every booster supply panel. That isn't necessary for most users but I need to be able to just see at a glance on McKinley if something's going horribly wrong. If we look at a specific panel, this is just, they're all pretty similar in all honesty. In here, what we have, and ignoring an awful lot of this stuff, we have a booster. There is a command station somewhere else on this layout, and in fact the command station doesn't deliver any power to any track. It simply is the conductor sending out the signals across the booster links. You have a, a booster here, and we have here, which is an important aspect of what to look at that we're going to discuss today, is the PM42, which is the power district, the short circuit protection. In addition, we have a pair of BDLs for this board, their block occupancy. We have point motor control boards, and we also have some infrared receiver boards. These don't do infrared, they are simply acting on switch inputs from infrared detectors around the sections on this track. And if I opened up any other one of these panels, you'd see a similar array of PM42s, BDLs, etc, etc, etc. Although this is a Digitrax world, I must stress that there is nothing specific about Digitrax in what you do with your layout. So the short circuit protection is downstream from the booster and then the BDL detectors are downstream from the, pit, from the short circuit protection and so on and so on. And this here, that's the RR amp meter. So that covers the boost areas and we've over boosted McKinley in all honesty and I'm going to show you on the staging yard outside in the hall what uh, what the, the power consumption is for a fairly heavily loaded section of track and we're going to really give it some welly and you'll see that. I'm going to put this up now and just quickly show you the looms for the new Wakefield board which is over the power wall here. The red and black wires are the track feeds and to some block occupancy detection but most of Wakefield is in sidings and doesn't have it so the red looms are relatively modest. This massive clutch of white cables are all the point motor control uh, wires, the power wires and the feedback wires. And then there is a small bundle of additional power circuits for different voltages to deliver things like 5 volts, 12 volts and 18 volts for the different devices. In terms of scoping out what your power supply needs are for your layout other than boosters, um, I'm not going to give any specific guidance, but behind me here is the power supply department for everything on this island. And I have a rule on McKinley, and I can't put any science behind it, it's just simply my, my rule, which is I work out what all the devices take in a particular area, and then I always ensure that my power supply 
has twice the capacity. I, if it takes 30 uh, watts, then I will find um, a power supply that goes to 60. And I generally steer away from going to any, from any power supplies that are more than about 80 to 90 watts. If I need that, I'll break the looms out and feed it with two smaller power supplies. I just don't want that much power coming from one device given the amount of wood and stuff that's in this room. So the device stuff is a, is a case of you doing the maths and working out what you need. The boosters is an interesting journey and I'm going to show you now more over on the staging yard. I've come over here to the existing railway. This is the staging yard and it's quite heavily populated. You can see here that we've got one of these ammeters installed on this and oddly enough the current levels are pretty low. It's 14 volts DCC and it's drawing 0.6 of an amp. That's incredible because there's 14 locomotives on this track. 12 of them are sound and lit. There are 26 coaches that are all lit and have people in them. They don't consume any energy, I suppose. And there's about 110 goods vans, wagons, freightliner trucks, and all this kind of stuff in this yard. And they're all resistored up as well with 10 km resistors. So the whole, this whole array of models here, which is a quite well-stocked yard, is drawing less than about seven or eight watts. Well, that's about the size of one of those LED light bulbs we have in our kitchens. So it's very small, so let's crank it up, shall we? What I'm gonna do now is I've got a class 47 on the Freightliner with a dead loco in front of it. This um, hourglass is cosmetic. It's there just so you can see what's happening. And I've got a similar engine down that end, um, a steamer, that we're gonna crank up. So the two of them are absolutely thrashing away really grinding against the dead locomotive and we'll see what the current level goes up now so bear with me because i'm not a multitasker just get that steam engine moving there we go up she goes to full-on speed let's change this one here and let's move that one here as well so now the steam engine is cranking up you'll hear an awful rattle as that diesel starts to move and we can see that the current is now at one amp. And they are really pushing. I'm going to have to just stay there. No, I might have to push that back a bit. So we got to 1.15 and it is absolutely making, as you can hear a din and that steam engine down here. And it's got no further. So on that point, I'm going to rest my case. We're at one end of the staging yard for the existing McKinley Railway. And what I wanted to just talk about now is rather than booster loads and that is back to power districts in a booster. In this area, it's really obvious. You've got four main lines going through with three staging tracks for each green, red, blue and black. Each of those is in its own power district and I'm going to explain what the benefit of that is or rather I'm going to demonstrate by driving an engine into a point that's set against it and driving another train through. And let's just see what happens to both. I set them both at speed step 20 this engine here will fail. It's shorted. And this engine on the other track continues. Now, what you're hearing in the background is a clicking noise, which is in relation to the short circuit system that Digitrax have got, which has an audible warning. It also sends out a message on Loconet, which helps us because it allows us to see where we have short circuits. But I think this demonstrates the point about having power districts in your command station or boost area so that you can, other people can, can continue to run trains. I'm then going to stop both the trains. I'll leave this one running. I'm going to stop that train. And what I'm going to do is set point 103 to be thrown, which will clear, set the power, 
and that engine will start to move. You can see that. I hope that's a really good example here. What I'm going to do is take it back now and talk about the wiring of frogs. The point I'd like to cover now is to do with the frogs on points and protecting your stock. If we take a look, a closer look at this point work here, the frog has an isolator here and it's isolated here. So this whole frog is electrically live and it is switched by the point motor. If I was to manually slide this engine over, at the point where it starts to cause a short circuit, and it has done now, this engine has not got anywhere near where the blades are against it and will cause a derailment. If the engine gets beyond this isolating section here, or so, if so it will then be in good track power. If you use something like a frog juicer, that engine will continue to roll forward, continue, and the first thing you'll notice is when you have a derailment, which means you've then got to pick the model up. And I don't know about you, but I'm always damaging my models when I pick them up. And so our logic here on McKinley is to electrically, um, to have the frogs live, and that they are the things that cause the short circuit that stops the train going any further than here and it kills the power and it stops the train being derailed and that's the most useful thing in any area including shunting yards so that's a crucial thing i hope i've explained that well enough the last thing that's worth explaining is our red pennies we used to use 50p's but people kept putting them in their pockets so we ended up buying out of circulation currency welding two together and then painting them bright red and they have a very good purpose let me show you have a train get it the right way moving through on the railway no one knows why it's moving you can literally just put the 50p on the track, sorry, the, the one penny, the red penny on the track, and it will kill the train until someone's found out who's got it, why is it moving. And if it's moving for a good reason, you can take it off and let it carry on. And it's now going to short on the next frog because that's not set right, but we'll let it get there. And that brings me to the final point I'd like to cover, which is if you use... DCC controlled points. I don't, but if you do, like DCC concepts, um, make sure that the DCC supply to them is upstream before your power breakers, before your power management, before your short circuit protection. The reason is, is often all you need to do is to be able to change that point. If you cut the power to the point motor, because it's DCC and it's in the same section, you can't revert the point. You've got to pull the engine back. Whereas all I've got to do now is, this is point 102. I set that to throne. That clears the short circuit and the train can proceed. I don't know why. <laughs> his life shows it's for real so now let's go over to Wakefield and let me show you how we designed the power districts for that section of the layout because this is quite straightforward this was four very separate lines that's a that's a yard stroke station so how do we go about that we're back at Wakefield here it's an ideal time to show you how we divide the power districts up on this particular layout. All that you see here is controlled by one booster. We have one PM42, which gives us four safeguarding zones. We don't have to use them, any of them for auto reversing because there isn't a turntable on this yard. There's no auto reversing track. So we have four at our disposal. The other thing to consider are there are three operators on Wakefield Two are real, one is virtual. 
One operator works at this end of the yard, dealing with shunting vans in and out of Horbury's. And they will see stuff that's happening here. The other operator is at this end of the yard, controlling the upper head shunt. You can't see that, but there's a mass of sidings up here and the point work at this end. The third operator is the computer, and that's the main lines at the back. They're driving trains. The computer drives the trains from Halifax through to Sheffield and back. The computer drives the trains from Sheffield to Wakefield and back. So those lines are in a separate district. On this extension line, they're both in the same power district because they merge into single track here and further down there. If they were separate lines all the way through to Sheffield, we would have made those into two power districts. But as it is, it didn't seem much point. So therein then lies the question, what about this middle zone? Because we've used three and we have a fourth available. What we chose to do, and time will show whether we've got that right or not, is the zone that's defined here where the 37 is, our trusty 37 to give some idea of perspective, and the lonesome wagon, are the tracks where the computer sometimes drives trains in and out of Wakefield. So these are, these are solely for computer, all the other tracks outside of this zone are solely for the operators, these three tracks and the associated point work going out here is for computer control and operator control. And so we decided to make use of the fourth power district on the PM42 for that area there. Time will tell whether we've got that right and whether it might be more expedient to simply not deal with this at all, to take that away, and simply divide this layout, whoops, there. So it's just three with an, uh, a left and right split. At Sheffield, we've got eight power districts. We have two for the main lines, one each, because they are separate main lines. The arrival departure tracks are quite large where the computer delivers and takes trains away. And so we've separated out into two power districts, roughly along the line there. One to the left, one to the right. So now we're up to four. We then have, obviously, the Albert Yard and the Victoria Yard. That's obvious in terms of the, the shunting duties I described for Wakefield. So that breaks it into another two. And then finally, the engine shed over there does require one, that takes it to seven, but we also have a turntable in this yard and therefore we've used one of the PM42 power districts as an auto reverser for the turntable. One interesting challenge we have with our shunters is that we've fitted them with stay alives so that they can get over minor uh, irregularities in the track work and the operators aren't frustrated by them stopping. That brings with it a set of complications. Here we've got the point set against it. You remember I talked about having the frog being switched and if I now drive that engine out at a sedate speed, it will career into the short but the, it will then continue on for a period of time and then it does get caught. If I now change that point to safeguard, so the engine can now move forward, take it back, and then then set it to Bernie's warp speed, you can see the interesting challenge we all faced with that. I'm now going to turn it back the other way, set the point, and ramp her back up to the maximum shunt speed we have. And that's the problem we want to avoid for all our mainline locomotives. And that's what happens. The good thing about shunters is they're relatively robust things. There aren't an awful lot of bits that come off them um, and the damage is going to be minimal. But it does demonstrate the point quite well, I think. I hope that's given you an, an idea about 
how to size the booster districts on your layout and then also within a booster area the power districts and the pitfalls of the points and uh, power packed locos. <laughs> it fell over on cue for the first time ever. Thanks for watching.